So the, the, the setup before me has already prepared you for, for where I'm going to start here. This, this is a Hadza couple and their youngest child. And I don't know whether it was true before you walked into this room, but uh, for a lot of people, the view that they have of what happened that was special in our lineage was the construction of, of the nuclear family in which we had dads um, supporting moms and offspring and a whole bunch of other things followed from that sexual division of labor. And other people have already prepared you for the argument I'm going to make, although we kind of have dueling models here to say we're, we're leaving out an important part of the story if we don't include this very important person. So that uh, woman is the grandmother of the baby at the center, and that's, that's the older sister of the baby. These are modern people. That's all we've got left, you know, is us moderns. But these are people who are foraging for a living, living on wild food in, in an environment that, that's the best modern analog we have for the one that our genus evolved in. And I'm going to put on the table uh, some reasons to really uh, think that actually what this woman, grandmother, contributes to child rearing is central to what's happened in our lineage. But not only her contributions to child rearing, but her contributions to our life history that have made relationships outside this family unit really critical, including these other guys. So there are other Hadza men and the relationship between the, the central hunter in the picture here and those other men uh, turns out to be a really important part of how he thinks about his life and how he spends his time and how child rearing works in uh, communities like this. And in fact, I would say not only in traditional socioecologies, but some of these things I think will start to seem familiar. Now, when, when I, when we started this project with the Hadza, my collaborators, Jim O'Connell and, and Nick Blurton Jones, um, started studying the behavioral ecology of these, these people who live in, in northern Tanzania. I didn't have grandmothers on my mind, neither did they. One of the reasons that we were especially interested in, in this ethnographic opportunity is that the, the archaeological record of our genus, if we get very early in time, in fact, the beginning of the archaeological record is the bones of big animals and stone tools. And these guys hunt these big animals. So figuring out how that works, and how those animals are handled, how uh, deposition patterns are produced was especially an interest of Jim O'Connell, who was the archaeologist on the team. And yet, there we were, looking at how people spent their time, what they got for it, and here were these old women. The, so the, the women that I'm showing there in their 60s when this photograph was taken, and because we were monitoring how people spent their time and what they got for it, there it was in the data, the economic productivity of these old women was really floating the boat in a way that we just had not anticipated. We were also astonished to discover that little kids were amazingly productive foragers at, at very young ages. But those, those tubers that the old ladies are cooking there are the starch staple for this population throughout the year. And digging them is something that it takes adult strength and, and, and sort of engineering skill to manage. Maybe not quite adult strength, but little kids who are just weaned can't do it. And so they have to depend on somebody else. They depend on their moms, but then when their moms have new babies, then mom's attention is partly on that newborn. And, and that means that these kids' welfare, as we could measure it, depended on the work of grandmothers. And so here is, again, this woman in her 60s, you know, showing her stuff there, how complicated it is to, to dig these, these tubers that like to get underneath the rocky th soils, and so it requires engineering and strength to do it. And this package of the role that these older women were playing in becoming especially important economically when kids were weaned, their moms could move on and have a new baby because grandmother was there to subsidize the requirements of the older kids. Putting that together with what we can see in the age structure of, of um, 
of these folks. This age structure is a signature of, of our species. We, you know, we, you hear, I was just reading a paper saying this again just recently, that because the life expectancy is now so much longer than it was before, it's only now that people are living past 40. But here uh, is, is this, this is uh, the, just the female half of the age structure. And the, um, each of those bars is, uh, the length of the bar is the fraction of the population that's in that, in that bar. And the green bars are the women in their childbearing years. And those, those, those uh, yellow bars at the top are the women who are past their fertility. This is the Hadza. We look at all kinds of other examples of human populations and we see essentially the same thing. Even if we look at agrarian economies in, in the 19th century, they look like this. If you're lucky enough in this population as a little Hadza girl to make it to adulthood, you have more than a 75% chance of living past your fertility. And if we look at, a, at the standing crop, about a third of the adult women are past the childbearing years. The combination of how childbearing works in the, how much imp how important grandmothers are to how well kids do and their mother's ability to move on and have a new baby sooner is in striking contrast to what we see in the other great apes. We're part of that radiation. Well, the best data for, for the other great apes are, come from chimpanzees, and there's the same kind of age structure built from a life table for the female part of the chimpanzee population. Now, if, if you're a, a little chimpanzee kid, you, if you're an infant, you depend on your mom uh, until you're weaned. And then, well, she's still an important um, figure in your life, but now you get your own lunch. And mom moves on and has, has a new baby. Well, that pattern of independent mothering and that, that there isn't anybody uh, that, that in general, chimpanzees, apes um, in general, almost never live past their fertile years. A few very lucky ones make it, but most females die in their uh, childbearing years. Now, this suggested that this pattern of fertility and mortality that characterizes us and this pattern of childbearing are intimately connected. And about the same time we were trying to put these pieces together, uh, Eric Charnov, a theoretical biologist, was building models of life history variation. And one of his models was about the mammals, how much variation there is across the mammals. Some live very short lives, die young, have babies fast. Some are much slower. And trying to account for why that's so, he built an optimization model to explain how natural selection would shape these things. And in his model, the thing that ran the speed of a life history was adult mortality. In his 93 book, he included this figure. Now, this is a figure just for the primates because the same general pattern holds for our order as it does for the mammals in general. And he was showing how if you know what adult mortality is, if you know what the average adult lifespan is, you can predict when the age of first birth will be. And he showed that that relationship held across the primates. Well, the circled point there is us. And he didn't, wasn't thinking at the time, but wait a minute, that, um, hmm, that adult lifespan includes this big part in which there is no baby production. And yet that average adult lifespan is the thing that could account for why we mature so late. We have such low adult mortality. And putting all of those pieces together gave us a picture that at least made internal sense. We could account for the things about our life history that distinguish us from the other living hominids. Uh, that, that if, if grandmothering is, is the secret, that our postmenopausal longevity and our early weaning and our late maturity all made a coherent package in terms of, of, of Charnov's model. Could also, that package could account for why when our genus appears, it gets out into all these environments that no hominines have ever been in before. And, maybe account for some things in the earliest archaeology. 
a very uh, promising collection of pieces that all seem to be going together. And yet, of course, um, you know, I still have lots of colleagues to persuade even that is something they ought to, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but of course, many people will say, could it really happen that way? And we don't have a time machine, but this is where mathematical modeling, <laughs> maybe if it doesn't come to the rescue, it becomes really important. And luckily, this uh, mathematical biologist, Peter Kim, got interested in the question. Peter built an agent-based model in which we took advantage of Charnov's work and this, the regular relationships among these pieces of life history as we look across the, the, the mammals generally, but as we look across the primates, and um, build, a, build this agent-based model in which we start out with an ape-like life history and then we add grandmothering, and we see what happens if, if longevity can uh, mutate, what will happen. And this is what happens. On the left, you see what happens without any grandmothering. So this is time passing on the, on the x-axis. On the y is average adult lifespan. And on the left, there's no grandmothering. The average adult lifespan of all the lineages that don't go extinct remains in that ape-like range. There are seven that move up to get slightly longer, but they actually go extinct. And what's happening there is a, a conflict between the sexes. The, the, the males are trying to push for greater longevity that actually the females can't support. If we add grandmothering then, so look on the right, that's 30 simulations with grandmothering. And what happens in 21 out of the 30, as you see there, is they move from that ape-like equilibrium to the human-like one. There's a 22nd one that's maybe on its way there. But what, what this shows is, at least with the assumptions in the model, there are two equilibria, the ape-like one and the human-like one. And grandmothering is the thing that drives the show between them. And once you start in that direction, you end up at the human-like equilibrium. So, so those pieces all go together. Grandmothering, at least by this argument, causes the kind of life history that we have. But there's more to the story. It's also the case that we're looking at this change in age structure, of course, not just on the female side, but on the males as well. So now, once again, using the Hadza to represent humans and chimpanzees and the same sources for, for these numbers, uh, fertility ends at essentially the same age in us as, as in chimpanzees. It's just that it's rare for a chimpanzee female to live that long. But as you can see there, not only if we just look at uh, fertile adult sex ratio, those, those uh, chimpanzee males are, are dying really fast. In, in the human case, male survival is much higher, and also males continue to survive to these older ages, and the females who are fertile are still the ones who are under the age of 45. And what that means, all those old guys are ahead of the game for the young guys coming in, competing for the same um, conceptions. And if we just look at operational sex ratio, so now we've added interbirth interval into the story, those are four of the examples in which um, we go from a, a, an ape-like longevity to a human-like one. And what happens in every case is the operational sex ratio favoring males triples. This, the, the operational sex ratio becomes much more male-biased. And more male-biased sex ratios, as behavioral ecologists know, looking at all kinds of animals, increase the advantages for mate guarding. Now, in, in, in animals like us, Male alliances are really critical. Relationships between males and the other males become really crucial to whether or not uh, a male can effectively make claims on a female. Cultural anthropologists have been talking about this across human socioecologies for a long time. And recently, Lars Rodseth has, has um, tried to remind primatologists, <laughs> this is a true thing about, about human social arrangements, that these relationships among the males within a community are really crucial to what happens within nuclear families. 
In the 80s, there were uh, uh, the development of models by, by people like um, Michelle Rosaldo and Jane Collier. And here is a quote from Jane Collier's 88 book looking at what happens with marriage in the simplest human societies. Marriage is primarily a relationship between men with respect to women. Conjugal bonds and their character and what goes on at home depends on what's going on out there. And the relationship that this guy has with his bros really affects how he behaves at home. That matters. It's a huge thing in Hadza communities. A man has to compete for his social standing. He has to demonstrate that he's valuable as an ally and dangerous as a competitor. And that draws his effort into public activities, and it draws them away from domestic effort. Now, what men do in this, in this society is hunt. They also collect vegetable food, of course, but when they're hunting, there are lots of small animals in this environment. They could spend a lot of time taking those. If they did, they could, those animals would mostly, when they brought them home, go to their wives and kids. Instead, they focus their attention on hunting the big animals. And because they do, it means that they fail almost every day. On average, it takes a month of hunting to get one of those big ones. And actually, the difference between good and poor hunters is you know, enormous. And when it, one, and one of those big animals is taken, all kinds of other men join in the, the tracking, they, they come to the kill site. Everybody comes to the kill site. They eat there, women, children, men. They carry away meat from the, this enormous public event that everybody's been participating in. And um, the fraction that ends up going to the wife and kids is a small one, and rarely at that. So there's, the, there's a way these pieces go together. Grandmothers are maybe. The, the key to our life history. What happens with the operational sex ratio makes mate guarding really count. Conjugal bonds are in tension with male alliances. And um, this relationship that men have with other men affects the way they spend their time, drawing public effort away from domestic effort. And the, these, these rare big game successes are a big deal, most going to somebody else. That, su that stuff that goes to somebody else is subsidizing the, the cost of children, the cost of childcare, even though it's not coming from dad. And one of the most exciting things about beginning to see the pieces this way is that there is an archaeological trace of this big game hunting. So we can put together theory, empirical data of various kinds to tell a story about what happened in our in our genus. Thanks.